Five minutes, I need to read this. All right, give me a minute. I am Leo, your host, and this is all of the wonderful members of EOK, a bunch of entrepreneurs. How's everybody doing? Yeah. I got, can't see you. All right. Uh, today, I'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors to start off with because uh, without them, we wouldn't be able to have these cool computers and uh, cameras and audio equipment and be able to stream and have this cool place to meet now. So thank you to Pershing Yokeling Associates, wonderful sponsor. If you need any help with your accounting or business consulting needs, check them out online at pyapc.com. Also, thank you very much to Ludica Neely Group. They have consistently written us checks every month, which is very nice. Uh, Ludica Neely Group is your source for any kind of patents or copyrights or trademarks. Check those guys out, uh, lng-patent.com. Uh, we have another patent attorney, Robbie Robinson, has formed his own firm. Used to work with Luda, uh, maybe I shouldn't say that. Luda, Robbie Robinson has been a long time member of VOK, has always been a great supporter. As soon as he formed his own company, he said, I want to be a sponsor. So he does the same thing. He writes us a check every month. And he's an awesome guy. Check him out for any of your intellectual property needs, copyrights, trademarks, patents. He's at robinsoniplaw.com. And I want to thank two more sponsors that have been just phenomenal for us. These are great companies. I know the owners. Uh, Neighborhood Nerds has been a wonderful sponsor for us. They take care of all of our IT needs and help us with setup and movie making and all that jazz. Uh, they are online at nnerd.com. They're membership-based technology support for your residents or your small business. Online at nnerd.com. And also, a wonderful sponsor, Fair Mechanics. Really? Who would have thought? Fair Mechanics is a new software app. If you guys haven't seen it, it's a startup here in Knoxville. If you own a car, or you know somebody that owns a car, or you've seen a car, or you've read about a car, you can use fairmechanics.com. You go online and you put your repair or maintenance need in. The area mechanics then bid on that repair or maintenance need. You pick the mechanic you want to work with based on the distance from you, the price, and their star rating. So it saves you time, money, frustration, and you get your job done real quick. Online at fairmechanics.com. Thanks. <clears throat> and today, we're talking, this is our lunch and learn. We do this every month. Uh, everybody's already eaten a little bit of lunch, and now it's time to learn. And we have two wonderful professionals with us here today. We're learning about sales, uh, how to sell, and, you know, know what you're selling, and how to sell it, and how to close that deal. 
without sounding like a sales guy. I know that sounds might sound bad. I don't know if that sounds bad or not. But a lot of people tell me, well, hey, I don't want to sound like the used car sales guy, and I don't want to be pushy, and I don't want to like you know stick my foot in the door and like try to just one more thing or anything like that. Uh, but you really have to do that. I mean, you have to be willing to sell your product or service. And we all need to know how to do that. Uh, even if it's a little uncomfortable, you have to get outside of that uh, comfort zone. So joining us today is Mr. Lance Cooper, right over there. Uh, Lance is a longtime member of EOK. He's president of Sales Managed Solutions. Uh, president of Sales Managed Solutions. President of Inlight Publishing. And uh, sales person, sales manager, trainer, author, speaker. Uh, Lance has a BS in engineering and an MA in speech. And recently has a book out on the market that we all need to read. It's Selling Beyond Survival. You guys need to check that out. Lance Cooper, thank you for being here today. How's that? Okay. Well, Excellent. There you go. See how sales. You get a commission. <laughs> and today we also are joined with Mr. Doug Soltis. Doug, uh, Doug and I met um, through a mutual friend, Eric Dobson, CEO of Angel Capital Group. Plug for those guys too. If you're accredited investor, wealthy, and got a bunch of money to throw around, you know, you ought to check out. <laughs> it's kind of like gam you know, legalized gambling, kind of yeah, yeah. like you know, betting on forces a little bit. Uh, it's a great group of people to hang out with. All the investors are phenomenal. And then you get to see some wonderful entrepreneurs come in and pitch their ideas in front of you. So if you enjoy Shark Tank, it's not like that. So, <laughs> but come on out, it's really awesome. Uh, so Doug and I met through Eric. We were smoking cigars uh, every Thursday. That's a nice little group too of people that are uh, hanging out smoking cigars with these guys. Uh, Doug, I learned, which is very interesting to me because all four of my boys swim, is an athlete and a half. Uh, was uh, sw swam for uh, for Florida, eight-time high school All-American, five-time high school state champion, state champion sophomore, junior, and senior year, member of state championship team, nine-time college NCAA Division I All-American, four-time national champion, top ten in the world, member of number two of two college NCAA Division I championship teams, Co-captain of one of them, member of the U.S. national team for four years. That's amazing. That's really cool stuff, though. I mean, like to. I gave you all that. I said, pick a few. I know. <laughs> I only picked half of what he gave me. <laughs> Those are the called the good old days. Those are the good old days, right? But Doug is a self professional, uh, representing comp uh, multiple product lines. Uh, robotics, uh, conveyor systems, and I'd love to invest in products. Yeah, I sell uh, robots, custom automated packaging equipment, as well as import plastics and tools. And, I mean, just a, the, your pedigree here is incredible of the companies you've worked for, worked with, uh, the certificates held, the licenses held, I mean, just very impressive. So we are glad to have you guys here today. So let's get rolling. Because I tell you what, I, I have multiple companies, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time about it, and what, what entrepreneurs suffer from a lot is we have built the greatest company, the greatest product, the greatest service. People are going to find us. I mean, they're going to wear us out calling us to buy it. And then there's crickets after you know months and months, and they're like, well, what's going on? Why isn't anybody buying our stuff? Um, so. One, it's just the, uh, I think you get so used to your product, your service, your company, that you forget you have to educate other people about it. You have to inform other people what it is you do. How do you go about that? How, how do you, one, where would you start? Like if, like if you walk into a company and they're asking for your help, they're saying, okay, we're not moving as much product as we want to, we're not closing as many deals as we'd like to, um, you know, there's probably not doing anything before they get to the deal closing. <laughs> but what, where would you start with them? I mean, what are a few questions? Uh, Lance, that, that sounds like start. right up his uh, alley. Well, there are three main areas that people don't pay attention to. And the first one is the sales plan. You know, where, where are my prospects? What are the target markets? How am I going to approach them? That's first. And what are our goals for revenue? What's the average revenue per sale? How many sales will it take? How many appointments will that take? How many you know, 
to be prospects in. Uh, we're going to tr keep track of all that. That's the sales and planning area, and most people don't even have goals, revenue goals, uh, much less planning. It takes a lot of time to activity like this. And the second area uh, is once you have that plan, how, how are you going to manage activity? How are you going to make sure you're staying on plan? How, how are you, how, where are you going to track that? Uh, what kind of sales meetings are you going to have? What will those sales meetings look like? Most sales meetings for entrepreneurs look like operational meetings because uh, operational issues begin to just wander in there and, and people leave. And, and the real thing was, are we selling enough and are we doing what it takes to sell enough? And then the third area is face-to-face -face skills. When I'm in front of somebody, what is the best sales process to use? to take somebody from barely interested or maybe interested to I'm an advocate of this thing and I can see why it's going to help me. Uh, so that, that's the three main areas I could talk to each of them. And you may want to jump into one of those. I, I see it you know, from a different angle and that is is that uh, typically in sales you got three different levels and I like to see one is the, I call them the farmer. It's more of a customer service. Uh, it's a pretty easy product. It's a low price. Somebody calls in, you get to know them, you talk to them, there's a customer service. The second one I call the hunter, but there's two types of hunters. Now, the first hunter is is the deer hunter, and I didn't know this till the first time I went. Is a, a buddy of mine said, "Well, you, you track it out, and then you go and you sit down. You get up at three in the morning, you go to this spot, you know they sleep there, they eat there, and you sit here. That's the that's the second type of salesman is the hunter, the deer hunter, and you just wait for they come come along, and you go, "Hey, I'm here." The third one is the one that most people think of as a set as a salesman in a negative way the pushy the um, trying to get you know close the deal before it's ready and that that I call the turkey hunter because you talk hunt turkey completely different than you hunt, hunt deer turkey you go find it and you track it and that's what most people when they think of sales they most think of the that uh, uh, over pushy used car salesman uh, type of mentality, and I think the world has changed drastically since then. I think that the the internet has given them an educational level to the people that, you know, if you talk to car dealers, people come in and they know exactly what they want. They can tell you about the car in Chattanooga, the one in Louisville, the one over in Fleet in, 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 in uh, Nashville. Heck, I bought my last car, CarMax, and I got it from Idaho. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was the best deal, and I love my car. So. Uh, but well, the problem with that is that there is a, that, that high level, that high professional salesperson, that level that what I call it, the turkey hunter, is the, what I call the guy that does intervention. And what that is, is when you actually collaborate, you've connected, you've proven yourself, and you're collaborating with your customer at a level where they're going, well, we want this, and this is how we're going, you're going, mm, mm, you, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And they trust you enough to go, oh, okay, well, how should we do it? And so that... That sometimes actually takes uh, knocking heads with them, and that's where most people get confused when they think think uh, of salesmen. The, the key to that is you can't do that. You can't you can't be a turkey hunter if you haven't connected, got perspective, disclosed the right things, had a presentation, have a long sales cycle. And that's typically at the high end. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the way that, from my angle, that's where I see it, selling selling the high end. My my sales cycle is 18 months on average. So, you know, at some point in time, you're going, you don't want that, you want this. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want that. Let me tell you why you don't want that, because I tried this and it didn't work. Well, one of the things, like, whenever you came in and you talked to Neighborhood Nerds guys, I thought that was pretty awesome. Uh, Doug came in and actually talked with my team. We've been phenomenal at growth. I mean, like, uh, our, uh, we've got 200 clients now, paid members, paying the monthly fee, uh, haven't lost anybody. I mean, it's just a phenomenal company. Everybody loves what we provide. But that that organic growth, that word of mouth, isn't something we're controlling, isn't something that's planned. We want something that we can execute to say, this is how you start a new store, and this is how you ramp up, this is how you grow your client. So Doug came in, and one of the first things he did was just kind of interview all of the different people that are involved with the company to hear what their spin was on what it is we provide. And I thought, that's really cool. And all of them, all of us spoke a little differently about our company. So I'm thinking that probably happens with everybody. Like, no, everybody's not saying the same message. Everybody's not on board with this is what we really sell or this is what we really provide. And then you talked about the same kind of thing, talking about the tools. Like, how do you guys measure? What does your funnel look like? What what the software do you use? Application? Do you write on a pad and paper? You know, which I mean, that's just important. So some of that, like, you know, how do you uh, get that information out of 
that little company, that startup of what it is they're actually selling, they're actually providing. Um, would it be useful to talk to their clients, to their vendors, to all the staff? Yeah, a, a good sales process to ask the question. Um, several tools will drop out. And about 60 years ago, stimulus response selling was huge. And that's where you, you uh, stimulated somebody to buy. The car industry did a lot, but everybody did. And, and as a matter of fact, today, if you don't know what you're doing, you just fall into it. Especially if you're an entrepreneur, because if you're an entrepreneur, you love your product and you know your product and you get a product fixation and you just want to talk about it and you want to talk about it in all the best ways and you fire those people. And those people don't even think you understand who they are or what their business is or and you have no way to align it because you don't know what the challenges are because you haven't talked about it. And so a sales process starts with some amount of report building, some 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 way to start some reported building in the very beginning, and then you kind of you need to come with a crafted set of questions. Questions that allow them to talk and you to understand what their needs and problems are, even if you think you already know. Because if they're talking about it, they're if they're dis discoursing on those needs and problems, then when you get ready to talk about the solution, you can talk about them in terms of what they just said with their own words. Not to fake anything, not to make anything inauthentic, but to make it very authentic in their world. Working in their shop with that person they were talking about, making that issue go away. And that's called consultancy selling, which there are a lot of firms out there teaching that today. Uh, but that wasn't happening 50 or 60 years ago. If you've never had that kind of training, you tend to fall into a product or an ego kind of, or a quota focus when you're in front of somebody, which means you're number three and I've got to sell you because I've got to keep the lights on, and you tend to talk too much. Mm -hmm. And you don't ask questions and listen, and, and you, don't, you don't really develop a rapport based on their needs because of that. Yeah, and, and it seems like we tend to talk in terms of features. Yeah, yeah. You know, like what's so awesome about us, sure. our product, our team, everything, instead of what the benefit will be to you, a person that's wanting our services. Yeah, yeah I, I, totally, I totally agree, agree with Lance. Um, the, the world's changed, like I said earlier, and he's, he's exactly right. We got smarter people. Um, I take it from a different angle. That, um, I've been in sales now 29 years. Uh, some of those stats are two years in a row. I, I doubled, I 100% increased two years in a row. Um, and how I did some of that, I have, I have two, two of my clients today, one I've had for 22 years, they've been sold twice and I've changed three different companies since then, I still have a company. <laughs> and and my, my, my other piece of business is I've had 17 years and they're out of northern Canada, okay? I met a guy 17 years ago over in, in uh, uh, Oak Ridge and he came in, actually, actually I got the lead, I gave it to somebody in the office because I didn't have time for it. And, they went and sold a bunch of stuff and then quit. And so I came in with my manager, and he didn't. He was living in Nashville, so he was too far for him. Uh, the long story is, I I fixed everything in 60 days. The billing, the invoices, we, we were gouging, and I was like, someday he's going to requote this and then find that. So I fixed all that, got the equipment going, had mechanics stay in there, got it all going. But what happened about four years later was he was up in uh, Ohio. And he said, oh, we got this project, we want to know, what do you think, what's the best way to package this product? Well, it actually was pretty simple, I told him what it was and how to do it. And first time was, uh, uh, they ordered from me was uh, 10 years ago. Now they're one of my largest customers and their, their product is in every Walmart, Lowe's, and Home Depot throughout the United States. And uh, you, know, you, you, see, you see the trucks, and it's kind of, and the only reason I got that, the only reason there is because of what, of the way I went through the process. And the process was, it was just, the company that, the, the, the public speaking company, the training company that I'm um, starting, it's called Rock Solid Selling, Truth in Sales. It's, it's how you start, you don't really start with trucks. <coughs> Most people say that, Ken Blanchard has a great book on it, uh, Stephen Covey Jr. just put out another book, but actually, you, see, you don't start with trust, you start with the truth. And how you, how you, um, relay that truth is really the critical part. Uh, to, to do it quickly is the first thing is what kind of what Lance was saying is I call it perspective. If you can't get behind your clients and see through his eyes, you'll never 
ever get all their business. Mm -hmm. you, you can't. You can't. Because if, if you're selling, as Lance was saying, for you, which I did years ago, you know, keep the lights on, as Lance said, feed the family. I need, you know, you know, I got stories of horrible things I've done in far as trying to close sales. I had a guy called 357 Magnus. Take it to my head and tell me to get out. Mm -hmm. Well, I realized I just met him. I closed him 12 times. So, um, anyways, the point is, is the perspective. The second thing of the of, of the truth and sales triangle is is disclosure. What and how much and how you disclose the details. Two main concepts: not only what they want to know, but also what they need to know. Mm -hmm. You know, we've all bought cars, and we've never asked where the steel for the lug nuts came from. Why? We don't care, right? <laughs> but there are things that we do care about. But what if the steel from the lug nuts were plastic? Well, then you'd want to know that, right? <laughs> so, so we got to tell them not only what they want, but what, what they want to know, but what they need to know. And you can't do that without what Lance was talking about, an in-depth disclosure of listening and asking the right questions. So how do you get uh, entrepreneurs over that um, you know, that fear of selling or that uh, that hunger, you know, like I've got to close the deal, I've got to make money, I'm going to take on things that I don't even do very well just because I need a few deals closed. Um, I mean, is there a way to educate them, work with them, train them so that they're comfortable describing their product or service, selling their product or service, but the without fear, having to go the through that is, fire? The fear is real. <laughs> I mean, young entrepreneurs, and I remember the lights were about to go out in my house. And I had to make a sale. And I'm sitting on my hands at Prudential's office, getting ready to talk to the manager. The reason I was sitting on my hands and had my eyes closed is I was praying. And, <laughs> and later on, the manager told me he was very impressed with that because he said, I really like the way you were meditating. <laughs> And I was, and I was thinking, my God, I got to <laughs> But I didn't, I didn't want to touch his hands and have all the sweat. <laughs> so that was the second reason. I, um, so it's real. You can't, you can't really do away with that other than uh, read and listen to the things that uh, keep you motivated now. You have to practice it. So here, here's the thing. When you don't understand the sales process, when you do not understand that it might be some rapport building in the beginning, that, that you need to have some practical questions you bring with you. When you don't know that, you default into talking fast because you're scared. Yeah. But when you have the questions, you know you can listen, take notes. It what causes cause you force your, force your, you into a system, into a process that causes you to look to them as if you're interested in them, even though you're following this this process. And in fact, you are. You become that way because you ask these questions, you listen. I remember the beginning asking uh, questions I was given by my mentor, and I no more knew, and man, knew what he was saying back to me about business. I was so young about it all, but I would write it down and act like I did, and I would go back and ask other people, <laughs> and they go in and make the sale. And the reason I made the sales because they thought I was interested in them, which I was just trying to ask the questions. Yeah. Later on, I actually could. Add that character trait, <laughs> and it made things better. There's something else I want to add. Most people don't know the importance of advocates. And, and when you get a customer that you follow up afterwards, make everything right like you said, and build an advocacy base of people that, that rate you at a scale of five on, on a one to five scale. If you do that, it takes five times more to attract a new customer than it does to keep an existing one. And plus the word of mouth that comes from those people and the extra products and services that they'll buy from you versus other people and come back to you well documented. And that that is what he based on what he was saying, having the right perspective and then asking the right questions and then generating this um, business relationship, but it's a relationship based on trust and authenticity. Mm -hmm. On how you handle yourself with the questions. And a lot of young people that do not have a clue about what I just said, but you can get the questions <coughs> and, and mentor them into asking those at the front of the appointment. I mean, you can say something simple. The reason I'm here today is I brought some questions, and I want to ask those to make sure I understand your situation, your needs, to see if we can be a better I mean, that's just a simple thing to say. Right. And but have the questions and begin to ask. Well, so my team, I talked to them. I said, I want you all doing sales. 
So you, you guys need to be doing some cold calls. I want you to uh, build rapport with whoever you talk to. Don't, don't try to get past the gatekeeper or anything. There's not a gatekeeper for our business. You know, that person that answers the phone could be the most important person in our lives. She, she or he may be the one that says when computers are broken and when the audio video doesn't work and when the evening is wrong or whatever. I said, so, so build that rapport early on. But they were crushed that people hung up on them. That people said, I'm not interested, like immediately. That, um, well, I already have a guy. You know, and they didn't know how to respond. And they were just heartbroken that people were mean to them. <laughs> They're like, we're the greatest company ever. You don't get it. You know, people love us. So, um, so that, I mean, that speaks to that. See, the thing they complained about, though, was that script. Was sounding like you had canned answers. Sounding like you were preparing for this battle with this new client. But my guys didn't like that. And it took you saying, I'm sorry, but that's why. I mean, that's the way it is. Because that guy or gal on the other end of the phone has no idea who you are. And you're the sweetest, best person in the world, the most awesome company, but all they're doing is cringing because that phone's ringing with an ID they don't know. And they think, oh, man, another salesperson. And they're answering the phone like, <laughs> you know, yeah. is this local business you're talking about? Yeah, local business. All right. Um, imagine a ladder. And at the bottom of the ladder, the first rung is, I don't know your name. Mm. And the second rung is, I know your name. And the third rung is, I know your name and who you work for. Those are all superficial connections. All three. People really need to learn to network. They really need to learn to get out in the community, in the specific associations and places that their target market would be. I, I would say that not only do they get, I, I would say that's becoming more and more important. The cold call salesman, the, the, the doing it right is, is, is going away. Absolutely. It's going away. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm calling on new customers. I yesterday I said a new new customer. I'm gonna see one uh, next week. Um, got a got a credit order this morning, and it's getting harder and harder to do that. So Lance, I think, is is right on in more ways than one. Last day of the gym. Today I'm at the OK. The night before I was at B and I. I literally have 10 cards that I could get you into one of those because of the connection that occurred it was beyond a superficial level. And as you continue to meet these people, then you rise above those first three runs. It's something shared, even where you're working side by side with them on the project. And when that happens, they, are, they have uh, more of an emotional connection and they're more likely to, to let you in. It's really easy. Mm -hmm. You know? it, it, it is. I mean, one of the things I do teach, I went, my first seven years in sales was, for the most part, door to door. I call them 20, call, 20 doors a day for about seven years in a handful of different um, project, uh, companies. Okay. <laughs> Real sales, baby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I, I've been physically thrown out from 26 years ago. You know, of my 29 years in sales, I've been on straight commission or business owner 26 years. And been starving, you know. I remember checking the the uh, 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 the couch because I needed money because I knew I could get to my third interview at 3 a.m. But I wasn't sure I could get the couch home, so I was you know, checking checking for changing the couch. I mean, been there more times than I can. And going back to the original question, um, there are entrepreneurs that fear there, there's a, there's a level of faith that you have to have, and and. You know, you can look at it. Most people say it one of two ways: fear of failure or, or lack of faith. I, I prefer not to talk. I don't think most people go, "I'm afraid to fail." I think they're like, "How do I succeed?" They have a, a lack of faith in how you get there. One of the things that I teach is what I call the tiny target, and it's a process of when you pull the trigger, and, and on on a, on a new job opportunity, on a new customer, when you close the deal. You know, when you ask. You know, I, I, don't, I don't really believe in at closing the deal. Asking for the business more than once, and if you do it the right, if you do it the right way, you only ask once because there is only one time. That's when all the questions are answered. I totally agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, so that kind of faith is 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 the problem. So how do you, how do you do that? Well, Vance found a way. <laughs> Sitting on his hand, going, "Oh, help me." <laughs> Been there, done that more times than I can than I can count. The uh, second part, of the, to answer the second part of your question, is, is one of the things I did learn with door-to-door -door sales, or even currently now, I'm calling on uh, you know uh, 
man plant managers and engineering managers and and whatnot is that there are there are certain ways that you can introduce yourself to ease that that pain. And one of the things that I told we talked about was just how you how you introduce yourself. Um, when I worked for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, I worked in a couple of different startups for them, and I was lucky enough to work for a guy that did telephone sales for outside salesmen, setting up appointments, sending brochures, and then he worked with 70 of the Fortune 100 companies. Now, this was a startup that was very difficult. There was 10 people when he started, nine got fired. One guy still needed to feed the family. <laughs> they hired five more people, four got fired. I still needed to feed the family. I would work, I did exactly what I'm sure Lance's book talks about. I did, I, I call on more people than I needed to because I needed to make sales. My point is, is that one of the things he taught me was this. when you introduce yourself, how you introduce yourself, whether it's specifically on the phone, is critical. We've talked about this, and it's called the uh, voice of familiarity. And most people go, pick up, and, and they, they say their name. I go, why do you say it? You know, and, you, and I say, why do you say, why do you say I am, or, or this is, or, or just your name? And most good communication. Commented on that. I, I recorded one because I was going to show the guys. I'm like, this is easy. Let me show you. <laughs> so I make the phone call. You know, the person picks up and says, Hey, this is Leo. How are you doing today? And she's like, oh, Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm like, I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. I said, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, your technology needs and what's going on at the shop. See if you have any problems. And kind of went through that and got through that person to the next person. And they said, Well, hold on. Let me just get you with Joe. Talk to Joe. And Joe said, Yeah, sounds great, man. Let's set up a meeting. And I was like, See, that's easy. And the other guys, uh, we, we listened to a couple of them making calls, and they would do that. They would, the phone would ring, the person would answer, and they'd say, hi, I'm John. You know, like, not, this is Leo, you know, like, you already know me. Hi, I'm John. Right. It's got the, yeah. And Doug was like, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're what they're saying. This is, it actually was called the voice of familiarity. What that means is, is that if you, you know, if I called Leo up and hadn't talked to him in 20 years and we were college buddies, he's like, hey, Leo, oh, I got your number. You know, what would Leo do? He'd go, uh, yeah, how'd you get my number? And I go, Leo, it's stuff. Oh, God. So this is, if you can introduce yourself, you say this is. The second thing I like to teach is how you introduce your name, especially in today's world. In today's world, is, and this is critical, the faster you talk, the more you sound like a salesman. <laughs> <laughs> no any hands out there? Okay. Uh, so one of the things I like to do is I like to say, this is Doug, and I pause. And I gotta tell you, if you got, do you have a gatekeeper, there's a percentage of the time they'll go, one moment please, and they'll put you through because you paused and you sounded like you know them. <laughs> and if that pause, you do that pause just long enough, you go, Doug, Soltis, thank you. Because <laughs> we are done. I need to talk to the back guy. So that's what I do because most of the, you know, like I said, I do with uh, managers and, and engineers and plant managers. So that's just an example that it can be taught, but it's still, it's getting harder and harder to actually just get somebody on the phone. Uh, <laughs> that's why networking is, is even becoming more important. Uh, let me uh, kind of add to that, not to what you were saying because I hate, I hate phone call. I, hate. <laughs> I, did. I didn't say I like it, I said I hate it. <laughs> The lights were about to go off in my house, and I, had, I got the city director here in Austin, and, and got all the names of sales managers that I didn't know. I didn't have any business in Knoxville. Said at the Holiday Inn using their outside phone at the Holiday Inn at City Bluff. And they made phone calls using a script provided by my mentor. I just used the script and tried to sound as conversational as possible. And you know, I got clicked off phones. I remember one time I said, I'm president of Interactive Communications, and we work with companies like MCI. And I got clicked off. Well, I got well. First of all, I got I hate the MCI. I clicked off. <laughs> so that part of the script didn't work. <laughs> Mark that off. So let me just say, I don't see the time. You're not going to get it. Period. Just period. You know, here's what I found out: fear and confidence increases if you have a plan that you think will work. And a lot of entrepreneurs have never been mentored. So they're just going hot, hell with the day, with no plan. Mm -hmm. And they don't know if it works. They don't know anything about approaching people like we're talking about and being conversation stopping or, or the techniques like that. Mm -hmm. and, and they don't even know that they need to call so many people in and get so many appointments, which will turn into so many quotes, 
which will turn into so many presentations every week, every month, got to. And then perhaps in an hour you can count on two to three appointments of coffee. You don't know those things, but those things are, are so readily available from so many books out there. And if you start to gain uh, knowledge of a plan, that you have trust in whoever gave you that plan, <laughs> then your confidence goes up. And when your confidence goes up, your results change. And you also stay the course longer. Without, it, with, without a doubt. And it, 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 one of the things when I started came to Knoxville, I was living in Atlanta, I came to Knoxville and started in the packaging business. What I did was, which I thought was a piece of cake, every Friday I'd set five new appointments. That was my goal. And I was like, that's it? That's all I got to do? Woo! I did that for a year and have never had to call on another person, really. I mean, I do a little bit now and then for specifics, but I was so busy. That's why that story I gave you, I, I was giving the lead away. It was Oak was that way, and I was going, I had too many customers that way, and I just didn't have time. And that was three years into the business. So it, because every Friday, I would not stop until I got five points. I missed four next week, next week was six. Mm -hmm. And I stopped, I, and I went that way, and I finally got down to three, two, one, and finally I was like, I don't even have time to make, make calls. i got to make two presentations. And, um, it, it's, it's, it's important that you know the numbers, what it takes in your industry. You know, and, and every industry is different. And every industry is different. That's exactly right. Um, and it, it, is, it is a game. I like to say, Lance and I actually, we, when I first met, we talked about plates. Uh, in my very first sales training ever with Northwestern, they, they talk about plates. And it's, what the plates are is you ever go to the circus where they come and they, they stick the stick the stick the, 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 the stick down, they put the plate on, they go like this, right? And what do they do? Then they put another one. What happens after about five or six plates? I need to go back to the that, 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 that. Exactly. <laughs> that's sales. When I was full time in sales before I became a business owner a few years a few years back, my goal was to have minimum thirty plates spinning at any given time. I would like fifty. But 30, 30 dollars in deep trouble. You know, I, I typically average 40, 45, 50. That means projects on the board that I'm talking to people that I'm working on. And that was how I, one of the ways I, 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 I gauged it. So, so imagine a sales phone. Now let me ask everybody in this room, those of you who are selling, how many, how many folks do you have to have out this month? I mean, what's your closing rate? And so that you can earn a certain amount of income or bring a certain amount of revenue in at an average sales size. And I will ask, but my sales size varies. Well, we've got them. All we've got them. Just give me the median and tell me how many quotes you've got to get out at a certain closing rate. Tell me what you think that is for yourself. Tell me you got to get out. Most of you don't know. Most of you do not know. And then back that into how many appointments it will take to get that many quotes out. And you've got to do those every month. But once you know that, and then you get a strategy for getting those appointments and going out networking and finding the prospects, your life becomes better. Right. It becomes really better when you have prospects. <laughs> <laughs> when you've got 30 on the board, in the funnel, working, you're a lot happier. <laughs> and it takes a lot of effort to do that, but it's consistent effort. The right levels of the right activities. The right levels of the right activities Prospects, appointments, quotes, sales. Right. What is your magic ratio? Everybody in this room has got one. Everybody, if you want to earn a certain amount of revenue, every quarter. Yeah, without a doubt. The, uh, um, I, I was lucky way back when uh, when I started off in, in Knoxville. I had an inside sales guy, Tim Madigan, who was phenomenal at helping me. But what I would do, I actually reported to Chet to uh, Charlotte. So they would actually overnight me my paperwork of everything I, that was sold because sometimes they would just call in the orders. I wasn't the little the little ones, and so I'd get them every day and I'd crunch the numbers and I'd see where I was at and I'd call Tim and you know where am I blah 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 you know. And they, and finally, after a couple of years, Tim was like, "Duh, please stop calling me. Call me at the end of the week. Anything needs billing, we'll do it." I'm like, you know, but I was so choked on living and eating and surviving because what they've given me is they give me I had a family of five, you know, a wife not working and you know they gave me just enough to survive and I was trying to and I was on draw, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so going in the hole every single day. And um, so I was I was like literally shaped like felt like that for like three years. And then finally Tim's like, stop it. Stop it. Call me on Friday. Okay. So on Friday I called the disco, did that go to this building? Then, then finally, about a month of the year later, Tim was like, "Stop 
call me at the end of the month. And Adam Bill, you're doing fine. And Adam Bill, we'll, we'll work it out. And when we're jumping back to talking about the level of faith, faith takes time to build. Mm. You know, you, you can't just go from, hey, I'm broke, I'm going to go sell something. You've got to build your faith. And, and you've got to do But the key thing about building your faith in the sales cycle is knowing what the next step is. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and sometimes we, we, that, that next step will. Uh, Will open up a whole new level, and as as Lance was, was saying, is that you got to know the numbers. You got to know the numbers. You got to know what's on the board. You got to know, you know. I knew what was, I knew what was projects. I knew it was hot. I knew it was postponed. I knew what, you know what, what was the percentage chance of closing. And then when it goes hot, I'm all over on it. So that, that's something else. Uh, like at EOK, we always talk about rubber the road. Like really, how do you get this done? What's the next step? What, what did you do to make this happen? When we talk about a sales plan, a sales process, and we talk about the funnel, you have to put that into real-world application. We actually have to do something with that. So if I sit down and write a sales plan and a sales process, do I stick it on a cork board? Do yeah. I put it on Google Drive? Do I say, here it is on the website, download it and read it at your leisure? Or, you know, what, what's the... I know that it's probably different it's for everybody, yeah. but how do you get your whole team on board with that and it's actually a living document instead of all of these documents that we end up writing, that we write them, we're excited about them, and we put we file them and say, man, I'm glad we got that business plan. Mm -hmm. And then we go off and do stuff. <laughs> like, Let's go do some stuff. Now, we don't look at the plan anymore. Uh -huh. We wrote that when we needed to. How, how do you do that? <laughs> Well, you're the entrepreneur, so you've got to be a product of the product. And so if, if you've got this plan, then I, I, if I were with you, I would take my people out and, and I would be uh, out there on sales with them following that plan and, and showing them how until they're ready to be let go. You know, I, I coached for 20 years and um, I could take a bat in the put that in front of a baseball player and I could walk away or I could lead him through it step by step until he could do it by himself when I was gone. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got the plan, then you've got to start coaching people, and you've got to be doing it. They've got to see you be a product of the product, and then be with them on calls. It's the number one place for sales managers to spend time, is with their people on calls. Because you learn a lot in the car back, mm -hmm. on the way there, during, because they're watching, and you can talk about your process, because if you've got the process here, you two can look at the process, but without the process, you just look at each other and say, how do we lose? That's exactly right. You know, the process takes your focus off of each other on counting this guy without making a sale. It causes you to look at the process and say, what is about that we could have done better? You know? Mm -hmm. I went down in uh, Tampa about uh, a year ago, and there were 20 <coughs> sales managers down there, hundreds of salespeople. And I'm going to back up from where you are right now, uh, Leo, and say these these sales managers didn't have goals. They didn't have goals. Interestingly, most of America right now do not have goals. I mean, I saw some of you right a minute ago. I mean, what's your revenue target for this month? And then back in, and then once you got that and you have this strong commitment and need for it, I mean, it's not a goal. It is not a goal unless there's a reason for it that's emotional to you. That's a goal. It's emotional to it's exactly. it's, it's 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 exactly. for certain concrete reasons. If I interview you, I can find out if it's a goal. It won't take me long. I like to say you own it. That's right. You gotta own the goal. Okay, once you've got that, then we can look at a system. Then we can back up into the number of quotes and so forth and so on. But unless you've got that, this faith and confidence and stuff he's talking about it doesn't happen. It doesn't translate. You just don't have the fire. There's no reason for Getting through phone calls that close close on you, that hang up on you. Exactly right. You got to got to you got to have a vision. You got to. Now you have, have to perish. It's, and, and I would suggest it's got to be beyond survival because those sales managers down there, what they ended up defaulting to, were enough sales to pay for the bills for the month. And when they got close to the end of the month, they were so close always. They were always frantic. Right. Unless you're looking at goals beyond survival lifestyle goals where you're going to have a better home or you're going to put money in the bank or you're going to pay your kids education or you're going to have a better lifestyle beyond your apartment money and your and your money for your home and, and, or, and or your car or your phone 
then you're going to always be surviving. You're going to be doing activities at level two. Because activities will follow the requirement for your heart toward that goal. That makes sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I mean, I see, I see us do it, and I see lots of people that I talk to. But there is no goal. It's just we need more money. You know, yeah. we've got to we've got to close some more deals. How many more? I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's got to go up from here. I mean, this is the <laughs> somewhere. I think that's kind of the reason I got actually into sales is, and I didn't really. Well, I got into sales for some of the wrong reasons. I wanted to, you know, rich and powerful, right? Uh, so going straight commission, Dave. Um, but when I was, you know, 13, I remember I wrote the wrote what I wanted to do in my main event. Wrote it down, stuck it on a mirror in the bathroom. And then I remember in high school, I remember I wrote it, and then I would say, okay, we do two practices a day, we do that five days, that's ten practices, that's nine months from now as a state meet. How much do I have to improve every single workout? And I had it down to 0.0003%, you know, every single workout. Um, and so that, that type of uh, goal setting actually works perfect in the sales. You know, you come out and you go, okay, how many calls do I make, how many contacts, how many contacts, how many fact finders, how many fact finders, how many presentations, presentations to close, and depending on your industry, you'll have, have the knowledge. One of the things that, I don't know, uh, that, I, the, that Mark Cuban said on the, the Shark Tank was, um, how did he, let me say exactly how he said, he said, uh, pack, no, sales cures all. <laughs> is, there, is there anybody here that, with a, a lot of money would, would, would be bad. <laughs> He's wondering, could ever, anybody use more money? Is that just is that just me? Okay, we got a smile out there. I heard one, one, I heard one person say that the other day. I was in a meeting and one person said, yeah, I just hit my, this is all I want to make every year. She's like, that's my limit. That, you know, why would you want to do more? And I'm like, you're kidding me? <laughs> so, I, said, I said, I don't have a limit on that. You know, it's like making money. More revenue every year. Yeah, and it's it's goes up to great. You know, if I say one more thing about fear, um, Carol Graff has written a book called Mindset, uh, Stanford Researcher. And what she's discovered, and I and I saw the evidence of it. I just was so glad to read the book and have somebody put uh, vocabulary on the problem. In America today, and this is affecting everybody in this room. You're beginning <laughs> to have a fixed mindset. Especially any one of the helicopter parents' kids. And here's what happens: when it gets tough, you quit. If it's not perfect, you quit or you fear. Because kids are getting trophies for just showing up. They're just getting, they're getting they're getting awards for if they just breathe right on the bench. That's not the way life works. It just doesn't work that way. A growth mindset. And she gives all these tremendous stories about athletes. The growth mindset is where you've, you've been taught the character, hard work ethic, perseverance, those kinds of things, honesty, in the face of uh, when you can be dishonest and win. Those kinds of things are long lasting and really what create success. Sacrifice creates success. Sacrifice, hard work, mm -hmm. staying up late at night, 2 o'clock in the morning, or whatever it takes all night. You know, realize you just don't give up. You don't give up. You do not quit. It doesn't happen. But we quit so easy today. So quit. I, I read recently that 90% of all uh, first businesses fail, but 90% of all second businesses succeed. Most people quit between one and two. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> wait, you know, it's not how many times you fall down, it's how many times you get up, and you only got to get up one more time. Yeah. But most people, won't. most people, it likes hard. Life beat you, beat you down, and you say, you know what? You know, I think I'm just going to take that job. We've all been there where you're like, you know, hey, I got this opportunity, and I'm going to, you know, skyrocket, or they're going to give me this, and I'm not going to have to, I can survive and think. Those are tough calls. Because you know what, just surviving and eating and not worrying about it, that's pretty good. You know, so I hear, I don't really know. But uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to say that uh, uh, that I was re reading recently is in 1987, before I started um, it, learning, actually, I, I, I turned off the radio, and back then it was tapes. I listened to 150 motivational tapes in my car in 1987. Uh, I didn't listen to music in my car until 2009, so I went about 22 years of either being on the phone 
or listening to some type of self-help, self-improvement. Um, because that, that's, that's important to maintain the attitude, to get the numbers. At the time I got physically thrown out of the jewelry shop, I went and made it at, at 10 o'clock in the morning. I made a sale at 3 o'clock that afternoon. I went and read some stuff down my, on my back. But this is what I want to say. It's one of the things I've realized, reading sales, leadership, management, marketing, your politics, uh, things. What I've noticed is that, as my buddy over there, Eric, says, entrepreneurs are, there's two things. There's math and marketing. But under marketing, leadership, management, uh, 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 sales, it's all written people skills, which is sales. If you look at it from that point, it's everything you do as a leader. I listened to another tape recently. Well, the best managers, the best leaders, they go to their people every week and say, what are you doing? How can I help you? I'm like, that's sales. That's what I do with my customer. What are you doing? How can I help you? You know, I haven't read many leadership or management things that isn't 80% sales. So what I guess what I'm saying is, if I was a, if I was you, and, and you did not have a lot of sales training, and this kind of what we're talking about either doesn't make sense or fears you, I would dive into it because it makes all the difference in the world. It's really people skills. It's how you handle people. When you shut up. When you ask the question. Can you do empathetic listening? Do you really care? You know, can you solve their problem? And that's what sales is really about. That's really what we're going to today. It's not just helping. It's it's connecting, it's communicating, it's collaborating to make a better world for them and for us. That guy that I met in Oak Ridge in 95 called me last week and told me some very personal things going on in his life. These were way beyond me selling him. I mean, I'm all about the relationships, and I, have, I feel like I have a good relationship with a lot of clients, and I've had some good ones over the years with the different businesses. But that plate spinning thing, I think, is very important oh. because I have had some of my best clients that, I mean, just sung my praises up and down, the greatest projects. We had two or three projects back to back, but I wasn't in front of them when a new project came up and they gave it to another company. I've had that happen multiple times. If you're not staying in touch with them, staying in front of them. Did uh, you keep yourself really good, though? Yes. Okay, good. But you see, I, I mean, apparently there's something wrong with me, though, because I've done it again, you know, multiple times of not staying in front of the lines. And my wife reminds me, she's like, why don't you just send some emails to some of your clients to see if they need anything? I'll do that. I'll send out three emails, and I'll get two jobs. And it's like, but we know, why don't I just do that? We know the manager is. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but staying in, you know, staying, staying in touch. Working. I just met in conversation with Bob, Bob, Bob and Grumbo over in Nashville. He's got like eight books out. And his whole thing is about staying in front of your clients. And, and he has a uh, site called e-relationship.com. And it's an automated uh, ability to stay in front of your clients. And it's um, tremendously effective. He has, he, has the, he has the percentage results that new appointments come from uh, this e-automated strategy. So you might look that. So it's, it, it, it's one way to have touch is happening when you're doing other things, uh, all the way with uh, the birthday type normal card stuff, to also things that get them thinking about their business and you're still around. Uh, those are all crafted in about 17 to 18 touches in a year in an automated system. No. Well, that's good. sorry, we're kind of running long on time, so now I want to open it up to questions. Uh, there were other things, but maybe somebody will ask. There's a lot of smart people in the room. Uh, so, get, anybody have any questions for <laughs> these guys? Who wrote the book, uh, Mindset Again? Carol Gravick. Uh, she's a Stanford researcher, and you'll find that on Amazon. <laughs> it's a tremendous book. Uh, if you, do you have kids? Yes. Uh, go buy the book right away. <laughs> 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 you don't want to make the, make the mistake of uh, getting them to have fixed minds. Uh, I read one, uh, The Ultimate Sales Machine, mm -hmm. Chet Holmes. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a great book. How long ago was that? Uh, it was years ago. Yeah, yeah I read that. Uh, Chet, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the ones that I like a lot is uh, Todd Duncan, High Trust Selling. That's mm -hmm. a, he's a, it's a classic. I remember reading that going, I wanted to write that. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it's all about what you do, a lot of the stuff that we were talking about. Well, and then Tim, uh, 
Ferris with the four hour work. I mean, there's there's stuff in there that I thought was really cool. I mean, his his concept is talking about finding your market first. You know, not building a product and going, okay, now how do we go market and sell this thing? You know, looking for that if you're an entrepreneur and you start it. Right. Right. And then hard work. I mean, he talks, about, you know, even though he's talking about the four hour work week, he talks about or smart work, I guess. You know, he's, he's coming in early, making his calls. Most people don't. I mean, most sales guys, they, they, they people, they really. I don't want to say this right. They, they mix up uh, activity for production. Um, you know, it, just because you're moving, that doesn't mean you're working. You know, so. <laughs> yes. I'm going to be involved in a very different field of my official background. And my question is, how do I begin networking in a field that I don't particularly have a contact? Are there suggestions on possible? I have a couple of them, and they could probably have some. But the first thing I'd do would be to find out what the associations were around that field and become a member and, and, and go to them. Uh, the second thing is there may be a LinkedIn group that these people like to be a part of, join that link <laughs> group and begin to put comments there and be a part of the group. A couple. Are, the, are these people locally or national? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would start locally and work nationally. I mean, uh, you know, you, you always do better. You always go in, in, you know, the levels of communication, uh, texting, email, person, you know, that kind of stuff. I, I would always uh, see Jeff and John. <laughs> um, um, so I, that, I mean, that's the way I always look at it. You know, with what I when I sell, the, the ticket items are so big. You know, like I said, my biggest client is in northern Canada. I have a handful of them in Chicago. Um, got some in Florida. You know, I go in there. It's worth getting on a plane and flying to see somebody. So you got to look at it from that angle too. I, I've always thought uh, uh, like speaking, like speaking to a topic to a group is cool because. Immediately, you're this expert. You step mm -hmm. up. So whoever steps up to the mic, you know, it's like, oh, they must be smart. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for some reason. Well, yeah, we're, we're going to make it a meaningful, good activity. Speaking is good. You may not be wanting to speak to veterinarians, but you may may want to speak here. Yeah. And where you speak would have to do with the target market <coughs> and how you got that speaking engagement. Y'all got a question for me? I know what Doug thinks about this because he and I have talked about it. But what, when would you say the sale starts and, and when does it end? When the sale starts, uh, it, it starts with actually it's happening right now for me. I don't even know you, but you're watching me and trying to decide if I'm authentic, real, if, if, uh, if I'm somebody you can trust. So uh, if you're on the marketplace and you're, after, you're close to anybody that uh, might refer you to somebody or could be that somebody that you're going to have business with, it began then. So when, when does it end? It, yeah, it doesn't. I mean, you, you, because after the sale, it depends on your market, I guess. If you're never going to see them, if some a Boeing 707 that they're not going to buy again, uh, maybe. But I don't, you know, there's always networks of relationships and, and if you're talking about the actual sale where they give you money, I, I, I think of uh, selling as a reoccurring revenue source mm -hmm. and I'm building a client for life, <laughs> and for life, so staying in contact with people is still sales to me because you're continuing to send a message out. Um, so, and, and I don't do all of that well. I mean, that, my follow-up afterwards and uh, in terms of keeping in contact with people, same kind of things happen to me as have, has happened to him. There's so much you can improve on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only go up from here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll answer your question. You did, thank you. Okay. Question concerning presentation and material. Um, a brand new concept, a new idea that should have application to you. How's the best way to tell you about this application? Our own speech, demonstration, what? Well, yes, <laughs> I agree with him. <laughs> well, there's a danger of pulling in this too much material that they don't want to put their glaze over, and too little material that they don't want to, to, to give them 
what they need. Okay, I'll speak I think you have quick. to read the audience a little bit there. Well, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, if it's a crowd, you're kind of connecting with people in the room. You're connecting. In the sales process, you've had a first appointment in which you had uh, got some information about their needs, their problems, their issues prior to presenting, right? And so then you only present the features and benefits that will fill those, and you're going to be really challenged as an entrepreneur to want to throw the whole thing at them because they've got to know all this stuff. And when you do that, you're going to fire them. You're going to see the eyes blaze, and when that happens, turn off your PowerPoint. Three steps. You connect, you prove, you collaborate. Um, connect, prove, collaborate. Okay, and, and you can't get to collaborate with you without connecting. Proving means that on a, on a handful of different levels, you, you, your, my time is worth something. So is my time is is there more return than the risk in the, in that? So if you haven't connected with me, the chances of me giving you two hours is very very slim. Uh, depending on the product, the the, the 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 higher the dollars, the more connection is needed before you can uh, prove. Um, proving is where you know when you're when you're selling, you've got the the mind and the emotion. You've got a combination of those things going on, and people buy from people they like. But the, 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 you have to have the, the the truth out there. You have to do it. like we talked before. Your perspective. You have to you have to come around and, and, and talk to that person, find out what their perspective is, so that you can disclose the right things, so that you can connect, so that then you can show them that it has a maximum return for a minimum. And all that takes time and energy. And the higher the price the ticket, the longer that takes. And only then can you collaborate and say, how does this fit together with what you do? You know, let me show you how this works. You know, and so for example, one of my my. Uh, uh, customers were looking at a, a two-lane, fully automatic robotic palletizer for two different products for a company that they might sell to, and and so they're not sure sure what to do with that. So I'm I came together with them and said, okay, we can do this part first, we'll do that second, and we, we can make it work short term, long term. But I, I've known them for years, so they, they they go, okay, that makes sense. So. I, I, I can already collaborate because I've already connected. I've proven that I'm a, I'm a, a low risk, high return guy. So that's kind of my two cents. Yeah. Well, the sales process is going to vary based on the complexity, as he said, the situation. When you have you may have six points to close, or you may have one that lasts five minutes. Exactly. Uh, depending on the complexity of the product, the issues in it, the amount of money being spent, the amount of people that need to look at it to give their okay, from maintenance to the CFO to the CEO on a complex job to one person, if it's a smaller dollar, quick, quick thing. And let, let, let me jump to the end. Let's say you have I have uh, connected and uh, uh, proven that you are worth the time. The, the presentation. Uh, is is like I said, it's all different. I can tell you that you know, I have, uh, my biggest quote I ever gave was like was like I don't know, 56 pages. All right, it was seven different integrated pieces of equipment, and I knew, you know, I read it for two hours before I got there, and, and I knew everything on it. I could turn it upside down. I could say, oh, that page. Here's what happens. Da 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 da, -da and then turn the page. And da, da da da. And there's and so. But my point is, is that. Uh, I've also been in what, with with engineers where where I, I do a bound proposal and I'll go it's two hundred eighteen thousand dollars do you want to see it yeah okay all right because you ever, you ever been with somebody where like you can see all that they want to know is the price they can't hear a word you're saying yeah until you tell them the price whenever I a company used to do with uh, corporate we would they would actually trim the sheet that was the pricing. A little bit narrower than the rest of the sheets when you flip through. It's like you miss it. <laughs> Hold on a second. I, I got to write that one down. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, stop like, like like knowing when you close the deal too, because I've I've been in multiple meetings where they keep selling. You know, the customer already said yes. Man, this is great. Let's do it. And they keep telling them the features, you know, like why this is so awesome, why it's going to be so great. First time I went out, yeah. the, the, guy, the guy told me they did long the, the selling with uh, Atlanta Journal. We did a lot of phone calls, and we'd go in and literally just close the deal. And the deals were three thousand a pop. And so I was doing the system where I call them, we send them a package. I call them, how do you like it? Send them some more. And, you know, about five or six phone calls, two or three packages later, you go and go, yeah, I think that's something I want to do. You show up. 
first time I ever did that, of course, I'm the first guy to get there with this guy, boy, was his name. We go in, we close, and we do two packages of $6,000 day, 45 minutes. I'm like, whoa, first time I've done it. And, and you know what Roy said? What took you so long? He was ready to buy 20 minutes. I'm like, I, I don't know how to sign somebody for six grand in 20 minutes. And so, yeah, you, you're right. You're just sitting there going, waiting for me to just shut up. Just shut up. Kind of like most people are doing right now. What's that like? <laughs> All right, in the gallery. One last one? Yes, one more. We have um, a good pocket of intellectual property, set of patents, and we have this concept that we don't have any problems. If it's something we think is applicable in medical treatments, my question is how or who should I be working with? The CEO? technical person because we need them to help define what this final product can look like that uses this technology. I've got a prototype of demonstrators, but it's not necessary to what you need in your application. It is something that should help just if you can, if you can make it fit to you. Who should I call? I have a real simple way of saying that. It's easier to go downhill than uphill. I'm with you. Hey, you always shoot the top. Like I will ask a plant manager or a feed, whoever is the top guy, yeah. and I'll have him go. Yeah, no, no, I don't do that. Call Joe. He's the plant engineer, and then I'll go. Joe, your your vice president told me to call you. Guess who's getting an appointment, right? And have you had any success dealing with universities or research centers to help translate some of these things into a product? Uh, we have, I mean, there's some members of VOK that have done that because, you know, the university and the Tech 2020 with the lab are always looking at how to commercialize that technology they have and get it into products out in the market somewhere. I would like to say one thing about this, your sales process. You need to be prepared if there are going to be uh, three different types of buyers you're going to face. One's going to be the CEO or the person that can sign the check. <laughs> Maybe the CFO can sign a check, it depends on what. And then there's going to be a user buyer. And that person will want to know things about how's this going to affect my world when I'm there working with it in maintenance or manufacturing. And I've got to look at this through through a day-to-day -day application type thing. So you got to talk to them differently. Then there's the technical buyer, could be an engineer in your case. Uh, it'll be a person that will look at the X's and O's and try to match that against something else and see if he agrees technically with you. Technical buyer, user buyer, and then the uh, money person. And then you'll also want to look for a coach. Could, could be any of those. It could be somebody outside the account that knows the account very well, or it could be somebody in the account that wants to help you succeed. You want a coach because a coach will tell you what the next step will be and, and where you stand in the whole process. Thank you. That's good advice. All right. Lance, Doug, thank you guys Pleasure. for being here today. Thank you very it's been much. great. This has been the EOK Podcast. You can find us online at eokhq.com and follow us on Twitter at EOK Town. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>